Columbus Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Conscience, said Mr. Shakespeare, makes cowards of us all. Unfortunately, this places conscience in a rather unflattering light, since it implies that conscience is basically a demeaning quality. The truth is that conscience is a kind of magical and liberating force. After all, how many people have become heroes because they were too terrified to become cowards? Major, I demand to speak with the British ambassador. First, please tell us your name. I am Lady Madeleine Marston Stathclyde. My husband, the Earl of Stathclyde, is Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs. My brother, Lord Marston, is Commander-in-Chief of the British Army in India. Who is this lady, Wicklow? Sir, she is known as Limey Lily, and she runs the biggest sporting house in New Orleans. mystery drama, A Curious Experience, was especially adapted from the Mark Twain classic for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Christopher Tabori and Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. One of the tragic truths of our history has been the fact that almost every generation has known the terrible trauma of war. For Mark Twain's generation, the war was the Civil War. To Mark Twain, war was the supreme folly. And why not? Wasn't warfare something that was invented and conducted by mankind? And wasn't the entire human race the greatest joke the creator played on the universe? Of course. That is why Mark Twain wrote the story you're about to hear. Hut, two, hut, four. Hut, two, hut, four. Company! Hut, hut, two. Order! Five! Parade rest! Something the old president accounted for, sir. Very good, Sergeant Rayburn. Man, I'm directed to read to you this message I have just received from the War Department. To Commanding Officer Fort Trumbull from Commanding General. Subject, undercover enemy activity. This office has reason to believe that your area, New London, Connecticut, has been infiltrated by enemy agents. These people may attempt to capture your installation, burn the city, and perform other acts of violence. Therefore, every officer and enlisted man must be extremely vigilant at this time. Signed, the Commanding General. Dated December 4th, 1862. Now, men, I can only say this. Though we are far removed from the combat zones of Fort Donaldson, Bull Run, Shiloh, we are still very much in the battle area and must conduct ourselves accordingly. Sergeant, take over. The 150 regulars of my command itched and ached to be hundreds of miles to the south and west in the thick of the fighting. I knew they would consider this message from Washington as just tap from the brass. How could I blame them? I was bored to tears myself. At any rate, I was sitting in my office writing a letter when I became aware of someone standing in front of my desk. It was a boy, pale, ragged, with big eyes and a trembling mouth. He couldn't have been more than 15 or 16. What are you doing here? Um, excuse me, sir. Who are you? My, my name? Oh, I, I'm, I'm Robert Wicklow, sir. How did you get in here? Well, how? Who let you in here? Sir, 
I sneaked in. You what? What do you mean, you sneaked in? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but it was the only way. You sneaked in here? You got past the sentry? Yes, sir. How could you do that? Well, I reckon they, they, they just weren't looking. Sergeant Rayburn! Rayburn! Come in here, at once. Wait till we'll see about this. Sergeant Rayburn reporting, sir. This, uh, this boy... He was able to get past the sentries and make his way to my office. Oh, begging the Major's pardon, sir, but that would be impossible. Oh, is it? Well, here he is. How do you account for it? Well, sir, I, I don't know how I could account for it at all. First, he would have to slip past the guard at the main gate. Who is supposed to be on duty there now? Private Pope, sir. And then he would have to elude the sentry on the inner perimeter. Who's pulling guard there? Private Sparks, sir. Parks and Pope, huh? Yes, sir. What kind of security do we have around here? I will not tolerate another incident of this nature, Sergeant Rayburn. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Now, getting back to you. What's your name again? Robert Wicklow. Why did you want to sneak in here? Because I want to enlist. Enlist? How old are you? Twenty-one, sir. Twenty-one? Rayburn, you have boys of your own at home. How old does this cub appear to you? Not a day over 15, sir. Sir, sir, I'm, I'm 18. I swear to you, I'm, I'm 18, but nobody believes me. When I told the sentry at the gate what I wanted, he just laughed at me and told me to go home. But I couldn't do that. I couldn't go home. Why not? I, I don't have a home. So I just sneaked in. Papa used to tell me, boy, when you get no satisfaction from the hired hands, you just go straight to the boss himself. <laughs> Poor Papa. They killed him. Who killed him? The mob. They, they lynched him. What are you saying? What for? Because he was for Abe Lincoln and the Union. They made me watch it. They said, let this be a lesson, boy. But his last words, Papa's last words were, Abe Lincoln in the Union forever. Where was this? On our plantation, near Baton Rouge in Louisiana. Uh, I was stationed in New Orleans. I know that part of the country quite well. Exactly where was your plantation located? Just off the 60-mile point, sir. And what's directly above it? Emmonsville. And right below? Kruger's Creek. Where was the Hotel de Paris? On the Tuca Tupula Street. Who were the two big steamboat rivals? The Robert E. Lee and the Eclipse. Sir, so are you trying to trap me? Ask me anything you want to know about New Orleans. You're a long way from home. I told you I had no home. We were burned out and driven off. How did you get from New Orleans, Louisiana, to New London, Connecticut? I can't remember too many of the details, sir. Can you remember any of them? That night, after they burned down the house and killed Papa, I got to the river. I stole a boat and made my way down the river to the harbor. There, I stowed away on a ship. What kind of ship? Well, she was a sailing vessel, a uh, German. Her name was the Landgravine Frederica Charlotte, or, or some, some such. Well, anyway, she put out to sea. And after a while, they found me. Well, they set me to work. I became very sick, and I don't recall very much more. I don't even know how much time went by. Well, but then one day, I was wandering around the streets of a city. It was New London. And that's all you remember? Yes, sir. That was three days ago. I, um... I haven't had anything to eat. I tried to get a job... So I could earn some money and buy decent clothes. So when I tried to enlist, I wouldn't look like a tramp. But it was no use. Now, uh, sir, is it all right if I sit down? I'm, I'm afraid I'm just going to faint. Now, you just sit down, son. You'll get a hot meal inside you. You'll feel so much better. Rayburn, yes, sir. take him around to the kitchen. Oh, sir, let me enlist. Now, I'm afraid... Son, I'll be such a good soldier. I'm sorry, son. Oh, don't you see, sir? It's fate. 
It's the mysterious working of the will of the Lord. Why was I brought here to New London in Connecticut? Ye sent me to dwell among strangers. But I say to you, Major, you and the sergeant are not strangers, but men of kindness and goodwill. Oh, I should be a credit to the United States Army, sir. Rayburn, what do you think? I don't know, Major. He does appear underage for a soldier. Let's quarter him with the musicians. We'll enroll him as a drummer. Oh, a drummer? Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Major. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you every night. How's young Wicklow doing, Sergeant? Well, sir, uh, he's a funny one. How do you mean that, Sergeant? He seems to stay by himself. He don't try to make friends. Appears to be, I uh, guess you could say, uh, absent-minded. He's always got a sad look on his face. Uh, well, we both know he has a great deal to be sad about. Well, when you're a young boy, it ain't natural to mope all the time. Give him a chance. I haven't had any complaints from the bandmaster. Oh, sir, he's performing his duties in a satisfactory manner. Well, that's all we can reasonably expect him to do. The commandant of the fort really couldn't establish a personal relationship with the youngest drummer boy in the ranks. But I felt so sorry for him. There was such a look of sadness in his eyes. My heart went out to him. I kept wishing there was some way I could help him. But, of course, there was nothing more I could do for him. And then one day, Sergeant Rayburn asked to speak to me in private. It's the Wicklow boy, Major. The musicians are down on him to an extent you can't imagine. Why? What's the trouble? What's he been doing? Praying, sir. Praying? Yes, sir. The musicians haven't had any peace for that boy's praying. Well, we really cannot object to praying without risking an incident at higher headquarters. Well, no one objects to his praying as such. It's just the way he does it. He starts with the bandmaster and he prays for him. Next he takes the head bugler. Next he scoops in the bass drummer. And then he goes straight through the band, praying and begging. Sir, it's a sight. Well, I can't understand how that can be objectionable. Well, if the Major would only come and listen for himself. This way, sir. Now, what I'll do is kind of try open the back window of the musician's parish. Oh, Lord, I pray for the soul and the spirit of Band Sergeant Major Isaiah McTaggart. He's a good man, Lord. Oh, what if he does chew and smoke and blaspheme? Oh, hey, hey, quiet! Hey, hey, take a walk! For all though his body, for all though his body is poisoned with vice, his heart is clean and his soul is pure. Oh Lord, give me strength to reveal to this poor sinner the shine and light of Thy eternal truth. Then, oh Lord, he shall no longer wallow in drunkenness. Ow! What on earth is happening in there now, Sergeant? They're throwing boots at him. He's kneeling behind that big bass drum. You can't be serious, Sergeant. Get no face of me. Don't mind it. If I hadn't heard this with my own ears, <laughs> begging the Major's pardon, it ain't no laughing matter. <laughs> no, no, of course not, Rayburn. Of course not. <laughs> I promise I'll do something about it. <laughs> A couple of days went by, and I was still trying to figure out just what that something was when Sergeant Rayburn asked for permission to speak to the commanding officer on a matter of the utmost urgency. What's this about, Rayburn? Sir, it's about the Wicklow boy. Again? Who's he praying for now? He's here to talk about the praying, but the writing. You see, sir, he's all the time writing. Writing? What does he write? Letters? I don't know, sir. But he's forever poking and nosing about the fort all by himself. Well, he's just naturally curious, perhaps. That may be. But every now and then he outs with a pencil and paper and scribbles something down. Oh? I would say it looks suspicious, sir. Mighty suspicious. 
Surely, Sergeant, you're not saying you... You don't think that young Wicklow could be... As the Major knows, Wicklow's from the south, and way down south at that. Uh, yes, that's true. Does the Major have any instructions? Say nothing about this to anyone else. Yes, sir. And see if you can get hold of whatever it is he's writing down. Yes, sir. Rayburn, what are you staring at? Yes, sir, I'm uh, just looking out of your window. Huh? What is it? There's the Wicklow boy. He's just walked over to the west wall of the fort. Hey, Rayburn, look what he's doing. Yes, sir, I told you, sir. He's stuffing a piece of paper into a chink in the masonry. Should I go out there and grab him now? No, no, Rayburn. Well, wait for him to go away. Obviously, he's leaving a message for someone. That means he's not the only enemy spy in the fort. I was a stranger, and he took me in. Unfortunately, it can be paraphrased to read, You were a stranger, and you took me in. They say the Civil War was the first modern war. It introduced for the first time the advanced techniques of social, political, economic, and industrial conflict. And while it didn't exactly introduce the concept of espionage, it certainly refined the tactics and strategy, more of which we shall see in Act Two. Not all the casualties in warfare are caused by physical violence. Some of the greatest injuries are not to the body, but to the spirit. It's bad enough that war forces us to kill our fellow man. It's even worse that we are compelled to kill our own spirit of trust and compassion. Now well, look, sir. He's gone away. The scoundrel. That young devil. The coast is clear. Let's get that piece of paper. He may be too young to hang, but not too young to be whipped within an inch of his miserable life. Uh, can you reach in there and get that paper? I'll try, sir. Yes, sir, here it is. Treat her like that. He don't deserve to live. We took him in when he was starving, and he... Rayburn. Yes, sir. Rayburn, I want you to read this. Is it a message? Yes, Rayburn, it's a message. I want you to read it. Yes, sir. Blessed be those who give aid and comfort to the stranger. For the greatest affliction of all is to be alone in a strange city. Alone without friends, without hope. Yes, Raven. As you can see, that's a message. Well, sir, I... Uh... Well, what? Raven? Let's forget this nonsense we've been dreaming up about poor Robert Wicklow. As a matter of fact, if such a thing were possible, I'd even beg him for his forgiveness. A few days went by, and sure enough, Sergeant Rayburn came into my office. Sir? It's about the Wicklow boy. Rayburn, I thought I told... I can't help it, sir. I was passing by the musician's barracks just before. I looked through the window. I see Wicklow all alone, and he's writing. So, I go around to the door, give a little cough. He crumples up the paper, he tosses it into the fire. Rayburn, you have but no I evidence to... Oh, sir, I jabber with Wicklow for a bit, and then I send him on an errand. Now, he never suspected I was onto him. It was a coal fire, new built, and the writing had got behind a chunk of coal, so I fished it out. And, sir, here it is. Let me say that. Yes, sir. And he's a hardly even scorched. Uh, Fort Trumbull, December 8th. Colonel, I was mistaken as to the caliber of the three guns I ended my last list with. They are 18-pounders. The garrison is still 150 men, although some are to be shipped to the front. I think our plan had best be postponed to... That's where I must have interrupted him, sir. Major. Major. Something wrong? 
wants it. Something wrong, Rayburn? Yes, I would say so. I would say that a good part of a man's faith in his fellow man has just died. A good piece of his compassion and charity has withered away. I understand, sir. But we're soldiers. And we have work to do. Yes, sir. We'll have to watch this boy closely and carefully. And we did. Every day there was a message in the same little hole in the wall. And the messages would disappear soon after. Evidently, someone was picking them up. Neither Rayburn or I could watch constantly, and we were afraid to trust anyone else. Obviously, there was a plot of serious proportions being hatched under our very noses. Huh? What is it, Rayburn? Sir, the Wicklow boy has asked for a leave to go into town this afternoon. By no means should he be permitted to... No. Wait. Of course. Let him go. And follow him. To Commanding General, Washington, D.C. Have reason to suspect enemy attempt to capture this installation and burn the town of New London. To Commanding Officer, Fort Trumbull, Connecticut. Place town under martial law. Suspend habeas corpus. Make necessary arrests. All summary court. Act with vigor and promptness. Keep the department informed. Signed, Secretary of War. Major. What can you report, Sergeant Reyes? Yes, it's coming to a head. I followed the boy into town. Well, oh, where'd he go? Nowhere. He stood in the corner of Market. Uh, what did he do? Nothing. But the Union Hotel is just across the street. Well, sir. A kind of chubby old gentleman comes by, man of about 60, well-dressed white whiskers. Yes? Wicklow stops him and talks to him. Could you hear what was said? No, sir, I couldn't get close enough. Oh. How long did they talk? Oh, couldn't have been more than a minute if that. And then what happened? Well, sir, then the old gentleman walks into the hotel. Did you follow him? I was about to, sir, but then, when if he don't stop a lady... A lady? A red-haired, rather handsome-looking lady. Oh, give her maybe 35. Was she also well-dressed? Like a real swell. Wicklow gabs with her for maybe a minute. And then she also goes into the hotel. Then what did you do, Rayburn? Then I see Wicklow go down the street. I figured he was headed back to the fort. So I go into the hotel. Did you find out who the man and the lady were? Yes, sir. The gentleman is a Reverend Marcus McEwen from New York City. And the lady is a British subject from London. And she's really a lady. Lady Marston Strathclyde or something. I, I got it written down here somewhere. That's a good day's work, Sergeant. All ain't over yet, sir. Coming back in the fort... I seen Wicklow sneak into the second platoon barracks. What was he doing there? Well, sir, you know how the men have their overcoats hanging on the wall by their beds? Well, I seen him sneak a piece of paper into the pockets of two of them. So, after he was gone, I just fished them out. And here they are. Uh, this one says, Eagle's Third Flight. And the other one says exactly the same thing, sir. Into whose coat pockets were these messages placed? Private Pope and Private Sparks. Pope and Sparks? You're positive? Yes, sir. Pope and Sparks. Why, those two were on sentry duty the day he sneaked in here. Yes, sir. No wonder he was able to get in. They're part of the plot. We have to make our move right now, Rayburn. We can't afford to wait another minute. Stand by. I've got to send a telegram. I'm prepared to place City of New London under martial law. 
Troops under my command not reliable. Request one battalion of regulars from Boston or New York immediately. Private Wicklow to see the commander, sir. Stand at ease, Wicklow. Now, my boy, tell me, why do you write so much? I? Oh, I, I, I don't write very much, sir. You don't? Seems to me you're constantly scribbling. Oh, scribbling? Oh, well, I, I do scribble some. You do? Yes, sir. For amusement. Now, what do you do with your scribblings? Oh, nothing, sir. I, I, I just throw them away. Never send them to anybody? Oh, no, sir. I, I don't know anybody. Who's the colonel? The colonel? The one you refer to in this note. Well, I'm sure I don't know any colonel. Read this and refresh your memory. Oh, Oh, that... No, I never meant any harm. You betray vital information concerning the armament and the manpower of this post, and you never meant any harm? Speak up. Sir, I, I don't know any colonel. Stop lying. But this is true. The letter was never intended for anyone. It, it was just for my own amusement. I understand the foolishness of it now, but, the, but there's nothing else to it, I swear to you. What is the Eagle's third flight? I don't know. Tell me about Pope and Sparks. Oh, believe me, I, I, I don't know anything about... Who are the Reverend McEwen and Lady Marston Strathclyde? I, I don't know, I swear to you. Now, don't make me force you to tell us. I don't like to use certain methods, but this is wartime and the fate of the city hangs on it. We have confiscated all their belongings. Oh, no. Oh, no. Something's gone wrong. Oh, please, please. Please have pity on me. Be merciful to me. Don't, don't kill me. Promise to protect me. Save my life. I'll confess. I'll tell you everything. No, no, no. I'll control yourself. Yes, I, I, I will try. All right. Now talk. I, I will, sir. So, you are, at heart, a rebel? Yes, sir. And a spy? And a spy. And you've been acting under orders from outside? Yes, sir. Willingly? Yes, sir. Gladly, perhaps? Yes, sir. Why tonight? The South is my country. My heart is Southern. And this is all in a holy cause. And the tale you told me of how you've been wronged, the persecution of your family, that was made up for the occasion? They... They told me to say that, sir. Who is the colonel? And what's the meaning of Eagle's third flight? Answer me! I can't. I won't. I refuse to betray my own beloved country. This is your final answer? Yes, final. As sure as I love my beautiful southern country and despise everything this ugly northern sun shines upon, I will die before I tell you one word. Very well, Wicklow. This is war. You chose to play a man's game, and now you must pay a man's price. Sergeant Raven? Yes, sir. Assemble a firing party and have this man stop. Well, war is war. And in it, we are given no choice. One kills, and is killed for one's country. War always brings out the very worst in us. But on very rare occasions, it can also bring out the very best in us. We shall have an example of this in Act Three. Shortly. And a little child shall lead them. Well, we have in our story a child, figuratively speaking. He may not be very little, but he can be considered a child. Yes, he impressed us the first time we met him as a poor babe in the woods. But look at whom he happens to be leading. Do you want to be blindfolded, Wicklow? No, sir. Instruct your firing party, Sergeant Rayburn. Yes, sir. Firing squad with one round full cartridges. Ready? Load. Lock. Firing party ready to proceed, sir. 
I sincerely hope you don't think we're bluffing, Mr. Wicklow. You would sooner die than betray your comrades? Is that a fact? Yes, sir. I wonder. Would they do the same for you? Well, Mr. Wicklow. I have nothing to say. In that case, you may proceed, Sergeant Rayburn. Yes, sir. Firing party. Ready. Hey. No. No. Hold it, Sergeant. No, don't kill me. Please. Please don't kill me. Oh, I'll tell you everything. Everything. But don't kill me. You will answer every question, Wicklow. No, have mercy on me, sir. I, I don't deserve it. Oh, please pity me. Please, sir, please. Bring him inside, Rayburn. We had to half drag and half carry him inside. We finally managed to calm him down. His resistance was broken. We brought in Private Pope. What's your name, soldier? Sir, it's Pope. Private Peter Ellsworth Pope, sir. All right, tell us the truth. It'll be better for you. I don't understand, sir. Who are you? Like I said, sir... Private Pope from New Hadleyburg, Massachusetts, sir. That's your story? Yes, sir, it's true, sir. Is it true, Wicklow? No, sir. Tell us who this man is. Major, how would he know who I am? I never laid eyes on him. That will do. You had your chance to speak. Tell us, Wicklow. His real name is George Bristow from New Orleans. Two years ago, he was second mate of the Coast Packer Steamer Capital. He's a violent person, sir, and has served two terms for manslaughter. One for killing a deckhand named Hyde with a capstan bar. Major! Be silent! Go ahead, Wicklow. The other term, sir, was for killing a roustabout for refusing to heave the lead, which is not part of a roustabout's business. He is a spy and was sent to enlist in the Federal Army and serve in that capacity. Well, Pope, or Bristow, as we ought to call you... What have you to say to this? Barring your presence, Major, it's the infernalest damn lie that was ever spoke. And so it went, with Private Sparks and seven other soldiers of the fort whom Wicklow identified. Each one of them, of course, denied every word Wicklow said. He detailed everything about them, where they came from, their families, what they did before the war. I decided to hold them in confinement pending the arrival of a special commission from the general staff that was even now en route from Washington, D.C. And now I had the gentleman and the lady from the Union Hotel brought into the fort. Major, may I ask the meaning of this outrage? The meaning, sir? Why have I been dragged from my hotel by some of your soldiers and marched in here as if I were a common criminal? Well, sir, I wouldn't say you were a common criminal, more of an uncommon one. How dare you? Do you know who I am? No, suppose you tell me. I am the Reverend Marcus McEwen of Brooklyn, New York. I am the brother of Congressman James B. McEwen, and I assure you he shall hear about this. What are you doing in New London? I am visiting friends. I wouldn't doubt that at all. This young man standing near the wall, is he familiar to you? I've never seen him before in the... Oh, no, wait. No? No, I remember his face. He accosted me on a street corner outside my hotel a day or two ago. Yes? What did he say to you? What did he say is the truth? I don't know. Some sort of gibberish. I couldn't make it out. He didn't say anything about plans for attacking the fort? Are you mad? Have you taken leave of your senses? Wicklow, who is this man? Sir, his name is Peavy. That's a lie. Arthur L. Peavy, sir. And he is the man you addressed as the colonel in your letter? That's right, sir. He is the mastermind behind the plot? Yes, sir. He is the most notorious criminal in Galveston, Texas. This is an outrage. Give it up, Artie. They're wise to us. They've got you and me and the Countess, Pope and Sparks, everybody. So it's every man for himself. Make the best deal you can before they stand you up against the wall. I'll have you 
you know, I am Lady Madeline Marston Strathclyde. My husband is Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs. My brother is Lord Marston, Commander in Chief of Her Majesty's Forces in India. Now, I demand to speak with the British Ambassador. Who is she, Wicklow? Sir, she is known as Lily the Limey. She owns the biggest boarding house on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. She was arrested for selling contraband. She and George Bristow and all the rest were offered a chance for a complete pardon if they organized and executed this raid. Well, what do you say now, madame? I am speechless, Lieutenant. You will address the commanding officer as Major. Major. I found your country barbaric and boring, but at least after today, it will only be barbaric. Now, what is the meaning of this little comedy? I assure you, madame, this is a serious situation. Major, I'm not given to hysterics. You're obviously convinced that I'm part of a plot to do something or other to destroy your fortress. A rather sloppily run establishment compared to the least of ours. Are you ready to make a statement? Do you realize that by throwing me into prison on these trumped-up charges, you risk alienating public opinion in England? Lily. Oh, Lily, don't you understand? They know everything. Take her away, Sergeant. The next day, two companies of infantry, a battery of light artillery, and a squadron of cavalry marched into the fort. Now I felt safe and secure, ready for anything. We had almost a hundred people under arrest all along the eastern seaboard from Boston to New York. But had we captured everyone? Was the enemy still strong enough to make a move? Major. What is it, Rayburn? It's the Wicklow boy. He's gone. What? Gone? He's disappeared. How could he disappear? Well, sir, it appears he escaped. How? Have we still got traitors inside the fort? Well, it's either that or, or just plain dumb carelessness. How long has he been gone? About half an hour. Cavalry already has patrols out. Well, he can't have gone too far. Search every ship in the harbor, through every house and town, scour the countryside. We'll get him if we need the Army, the Navy, and the United States Marines. <laughs> To commanding officer, Fort Trumbull, Connecticut. Appreciate your inspired efforts and heads-up job in destroying rebel plot. And coming personally to congratulate, decorate, and promote. She'll be in New London by this evening. Signed, the Secretary of War. Major, they think they got him. Where is he? The cavalry commander says a boy of that description was seen going into a farmhouse about ten miles north of town. Have they taken him? No, sir. They've got the place surrounded. For him, he can't get away. Let's get out there, Rayburn. <laughs> Lieutenant, the sergeant and I will move in first. Be prepared to cover us. Let's go, Rayburn. Yes, sir. Make your way over to the side. No noise now. I'll take the lead. Be careful, sir. That window there. Let's get on either side of it. Yes, sir. Your pistol ready to fire? Cocked and ready, sir. All right. Now, can you see inside that window? Yes, sir. Appears to be a kitchen. There's an old lady on her knees. And praying, kneeling beside her is... We closer. Come on. We'll see if the door is open. Don't seem to be locked. Praise the Lord. My boy, my darling. The lost is found. The dead are alive again. Stand still, both of you, Domo. Oh, my goodness, is something wrong? Robert, have you done anything wrong? Why, Sergeant Rayburn. By all its hope. Mother Wicklow. Sergeant, what's happening here? Robert has come back. Oh, poor Robert. I, I thought he was dead all these years. Madam, is this your son? My own darling Robert. Rayburn. The, sir, the, the, the name Wick, Wicklow. I, 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 I didn't make the connection. 
Everybody here about knows Mother Wicklow. Robert, did you get into trouble when you were gone? No, Mama, no. Uh, and then this is her son? Robert, where have you been all this time? You're talking to your Mama now. I've been living in New Haven, Mama. I've been going to Yale University. Robert. Well, I, I, I was a janitor. But I got so homesick after a while, I, I just had to come home. Oh, he's all right, gentlemen. But I'm afraid his mind has been turned. Turned by what? Oh, all those dime novels and sensation story newspapers about all kinds of dark plots and mysteries. <laughs> he's always making up all kinds of fables. It's so hard sometimes not to believe him. No, no, no. Let me uh, try to understand this. He... Does not come from the South? Oh, bless you, sir. No. And his father was never lynched by by a mob? Oh, sir. His father was gathered into glory in the peace and fullness of his years. And he made it up? Every single word? Oh, he's so convincing, Major. I hope you didn't believe him. Whatever it was he told you... Poor boy, it's like a, a sickness. He can't help telling those wonderful yarns. He reads so much about all these places all over the world. He, he can make you actually see them. Madam, do you realize that on account of him, I have placed the city of New London under martial law? Oh, I'm sorry. I have put more than a hundred innocent people under arrest, including the clergyman brother of a congressman and the wife of the British Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs and who happens to be the sister of the commander of the British Army in India. Now, that was the foolish thing to do, Robert. I shan't do it again, Mama. Oh, you will. You will. If I know you, you will. There will be a congressional investigation of the army. The British outrage may now decide to recognize the Confederate States, at which time, if we attempt to blockade their ships on southern ports, we invite another war with England. Oh, Robert, you are a naughty boy. But of more pressing and immediate personal importance to me. The Secretary of War is due here any hour tonight to congratulate, decorate, and promote me for my masterly handling of this affair. Oh, my. Oh, I do wish there was some way I could help you. There is. Could you tell me what to say to him? <laughs> she couldn't. Who could? Many, many years ago, one of the cigarette companies that is now defunct ran a series of distinctive ads. Each pictured a person in an extremely embarrassing position and underneath the caption read, Be nonchalant. Do you remember? Ask your dad. Or better, your granddad. I shall return shortly. you're dying to know how the Major got out of it, or if he got out of it, I don't know. That was part of Mark Twain's unique genius. He could not only tell you an engrossing story, but when it was over, you could get your own mind running in fantastic directions to come up with a sequel. Today, this kind of thing is called audience participation. So you see, nothing is ever really new. Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Robert Dryden, Bryna Rayburn, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. It couldn't be written. The book that hit America like a runner.